influence of climate on forests is part of the big picture, but every individual tree species reacts differently to climate and has different strategies to grow. So when we see a, an old ancient ponderosa pine, like this 550 year old pine located at Prim's Meadow, all of the factors that determined its age and allowed it to grow on this site really have to be considered because every individual tree species has different strategies and different growth forms. Anytime a forest develops on a site, the circumstances are usually similar. Some kind of disturbance has disturbed the normal vegetation that's there, either in this case fire or historically a receding glacier might have created the same circumstance where a soil medium is left behind that has ample moisture and ample nutrients and now it's a mad scramble for the species that are in their surrounding areas that have seeds to invade this site, colonize it, and take advantage of these abundant resources that are made available by this disturbance. Any plant species needs to have water, nutrients, and the type of medium that will hold those available to that plant in order for it to establish on the site. This burned area leaves behind rock and ash and soil in between. Any seed that lands on the rock will perish, whereas a seed that lands in a crack or fissure in the soil medium will get enough moisture and potential nutrients to develop into a mature plant. But first, there has to be a seed source. In the case of trees, it's the cones that are produced near the top of the tree. Not all trees produce cones every year, and not always do those cones have viable seeds in them. These are episodic events based on, the, again, the local weather and climatic history. When trees have had abundant moisture and sunlight to produce excess energy, they can then produce a cone crop. Not all tree species have the same kinds of seeds. Each has a different seed size and a different strategy for disseminating its seed across the landscape. Depicted on this diagram are the relative sizes of seeds produced by ponderosa pine, lodgepole pine, douglas fir, grand fir, and larch, magnified approximately four times. Ponderosa pine with its large seed does not fly or disperse with wind very well. Its typical method of dispersal is the cone dropping to the ground and rolling down a hillside, scattering its seed as it rolls down. Opposed to this is western larch, which produces the smallest seed about the size of a poppy kernel uh, that has wings on it and can disperse over many miles of the landscape with the wind blowing it. Seed size has its drawbacks. Uh, one of them is dispersal, but the other is how much energy each respective species seed has. The relatively large ponderosa pine seed has a lot of energy in it, so it can produce a relatively large or long root radical depicted next to the seed on here so that when the seed doesn't land in exactly the perfect spot, that root still may be able to find a zone where adequate moisture and nutrients are available. Opposed to that is western larch that can disperse over great distances, but the tiny little seed has very little energy, so it can only produce a very small rootlet. Thus, in order for the seed to germinate and grow into seedling, it has to land in exactly the right type of medium. When we examine the medium that's available for tree seeds to land on, as depicted underneath the seeds, we see that starting with the mineral soil, which is the geologic substrate and broken down uh, rock material that forms what we call mineral soil, over that is the organic layer of decomposed woody debris and needles, and the very top layer is the undecomposed needle, or what we refer to as litter layer. Typically seeds that land on a litter layer cannot get their root into a source of adequate moisture and they perish. So this litter layer needs to be disturbed down into the humus layer, which is the decomposed material, or even better, the mineral soil, which really holds most of the stored water and nutrients on any particular site. Therefore, tree seeds have a hard time germinating on an intact forest layer, whereas when there's a disturbance such as fire, landslide, avalanche, or logging that exposes mineral soil, it allows uh, seeds, uh, particularly the small ones such as larch, to produce a rootlet that grows into exactly the right medium for them to grow. And therefore disturbance is a very important part to recruit tree seedlings on a site. When a tree seed germinates the first year, it'll produce a little seedling, which is the top, the needles that uh, photosynthesizes uh, sun's energy and absorb carbon dioxide into sugar. That sugar in turn is used to grow the woody tissue, the stem, and the root system. 
This is a two-year-old Ponderosa pine seedling. To give you an idea of the proportion, the root system of a Ponderosa pine seedling can extend that first year into the soil as much as three or four feet in order to find adequate moisture. This allows Ponderosa pine, just like western larch or lodgepole pine, to colonize extremely harsh sites because the biggest thing that impacts these seedlings is drought. If they dry out and don't get adequate moisture, they will die. Different tree species strategies of different root systems are also adaptations to the type of environment they typically colonize. Pioneer species like Ponderosa pine develops immediately a deep taproot system to find water on an exposed site where the soil surface temperature can reach in excess of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So unless that tree seedling gets adequate moisture so that it can transpire water, keeping itself cool, it will die. A species such as Douglas fir or grand fir that doesn't produce that deep taproot would perish on an exposed site like that. Alternatively, a fibrous shallow root system is designed to take advantage of the nutrient-rich layer that's underneath an organic layer. And so shade-tolerant species such as Douglas fir and grand fir will produce this fine root system in order to exploit the nutrients that is right on the interface between the organic layer and the mineral soil as depicted on this diagram. These trees in general have different life strategies uh, in any forested ecosystem where what are called shade intolerant or sun tolerant species such as ponderosa pine, larch, and lodgepole pine tend to have an open canopy to disperse the sun's heat because they're growing on hot dry sites. They have thick buds that don't dry out as quickly. They have thick bark that keeps high surface temperatures away from the living tissue and they have deep upper roots. Alternatively, shade tolerant species have a dense canopy to absorb all the available sunlight underneath an existing canopy of trees. They tend to have small fine buds, but very many of them. They have thinner bark because they don't have to invest in a thicker bark to resist high temperatures. And they have shallow upper roots to take advantage of that nutrient rich duff layer that forms underneath a pioneer tree species. So seedlings, when they grow and they develop on a site, require different medium in order to flourish. This newly germinated ponderosa pine seedling has found mineral soil. By this time, already has a root that goes down into the soil uh, two feet, and it's supplying itself with adequate moisture to stay cool in this hot environment. After one year, that ponderosa pine seedling will look like this fairly robust and full of energy, ready to keep growing on this hot, dry site where this darkened soil surface will get excessively hot. Alternatively, here's a one-year-old Douglas fir seedling growing on the same site that doesn't have that deep root system and is one step away from dying because it's not adapted to grow on such an exposed site. It requires that high nutrient and high water holding capacity of a uh, more organic soil layer and hence is adapted to germinate and survive underneath the existing canopy of a pioneer tree species. Typically, we see this phenomenon across landscapes where here's a ponderosa pine forest that developed after a fire, after disturbance on this hot, dry soil, and is growing very well. And now we see Douglas fir, the more shade tolerant species, slowly colonizing underneath the ponderosa pine. And over years, it gets bigger and denser and can eventually overwhelm and overtop that ponderosa pine, eventually even outcompeting the ponderosa pine and creating great water stress and killing the tree. All of the forest ecosystems across the Northern Rockies go through this dynamic process where some disturbance, whether it's fire or logging, or even historically retreating glaciers, open up bare soil, which in turn is colonized by what we call pioneer tree species so-called because they can tolerate the extreme heat of bare soil in the direct sunlight, and they can also develop a deep root system that can find water underneath those extreme, extremely hot soil surfaces. These are then followed by the more shade tolerant species that in order to survive in an ecosystem already colonized by the pioneer species have developed their own unique adaptations, which is shade tolerant needles that can acquire adequate light for photosynthesis in the shade of the pioneer species 
and a shallower root system that can capitalize on the nutrient cycling that occurs on the soil surface when dead needles and twigs fall down and release their nutrients, as well as capture water that comes in the form of rain or snow, and that shallow root system allows them to acquire that water before it percolates into, into the deeper soils where the taprooted species are mainly looking for water. This gives them a unique competitive advantage and allows them to eventually dominate a site in the absence of any disturbance which favors the pioneer tree species. So of the two most important factors that determine tree growth, water and light, root systems are one adaptations that tree species have developed in order to find a niche and a competitive advantage where they can survive on a site. Pioneer species such as pines and larch have a taproot system to avoid the hot soil surface layers and to find deeper water sources, particularly on drought prone sites. This is opposed to the more shade tolerant species and because they can reproduce in the shade, we often refer to them as climax species because in the absence of disturbance, they will persist on a site, shading out the pioneer tree species that need full sunlight. But their shallow root systems are uniquely adapted to give trees an advantage in a site already colonized by trees. It's important to note that competition between individuals within a species and between individuals of different species is a driving force that pushes evolution of these tree species that allows them to form new adaptations, new competitive advantages that allows them to further colonize greater areas across the landscape. Competition is what drives evolution on these sites and it drives adaptation. So these two trees are demonstrating active competition for limited soil resources such as water in this case. Water being one of the most limited resources across the Northern Rockies which as in previous sections was explained determines which species can grow where and how well it grows. That means how fast and how robust that tree species can be. The other part of this picture is also, of course, competition for sunlight. The same dynamic where you have pioneer tree species and shade tolerant tree species creates changes across these ecosystems that as a pioneer tree species has occupied and colonized a site, forming uh, what we might term a healthy and robust forest, the shade tolerant species that move in underneath in the shade eventually grow tall and compete with the pioneer tree species that require full sunlight to the point where they can actually push out and kill the original pioneer species and in this process create a more dense forest that may not actually be sustainable on this site because as the canopy gets denser more rainfall, more snow is intercepted and therefore a site that originally might be getting 24 inches to 30 inches of rainfall and snow melt every year, with this dense canopy intercepting half of that rain and half of the snow, evaporating it back in the atmosphere, actually can create a drought scenario, even though there's more trees per acre now and the water requirement for this forest is much higher. And this in turn can lead to catastrophic failures across the landscape. So what proportion of a forested landscape is in this highly competitive end stage of secondary succession, as we call it, where you have both shade tolerant and shade intolerant species. In this case, in this picture, we have uh, perhaps a 500 year old ponderosa pine that originally colonized this site that is being extensively crowded by the more shade tolerant Douglas fir and grand fir on this site, where now this system is getting less water delivered to the soil because of the canopy interception of rain and snow yet the leaf area is so much higher that the demand for water is double or even triple what it used to be when only the pioneer tree species were colonizing this site. This sets this stand up for a catastrophic failure due to wildfire, insects, or disease, perhaps starting the whole process over again.